My name is Marcus and I'm a senior data scientist at Scout24. Scout24 operates two large marketplaces in Germany and other European countries. One is focused on real estate and the other one on mobility. Today I want to talk about my latest project for Autoscout24. And it's really all about going from a search entry that is dominated by radio buttons and drop-down menus to this, a simple text box. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned to my dad that we are now live with a new feature, and he cheekily commented that Google seems to have already built something similar. And he's right, of course. Text search is nothing new these days. So what makes this an interesting problem? The thing is, if you're looking to buy a car, keyword search is not good enough. We have more than 2 million listings across Europe on Autoscout, and if you want to bring that down to a smaller number so that you can start contacting the sellers, you need to filter, be it by location, price, mileage, or equipment, makes, and models. Ultimately, this is a structured search problem. So our goal with this feature is really to provide an alternative search entry so that our users have to think about filters. Ideally, they can what they're looking for, and we map it to the corresponding filters and keywords. So let's look at a query to see what kind of compo components we would like to extract. Audi R6 Performance Panorama 2018. Audi is a make. R6 is a model. Performance is a specific version of that model. Panorama is an equipment. And 2018 is a first registration. So here we have a user who looks for a specific combination of a make model with one specific version, um, a panorama roof, and uh, built from 2018 onwards. And ideally, when we show such an input to a system, we would like the system to set three filters, one keyword, and one range query. So from a machine learning perspective, I decided to approach this as a sequence-to-sequence -sequence problem. And sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, learning is, is quite something amazing, I have to say. It's a very generic framework, essentially, that allows you to go from a variable length input sequence to a variable length output sequence. So you train a model to map from an input to an output. And typically, this is done using an encoder-decoder architecture. So you have an encoder that looks at the inputs and produces embeddings, and you have a decoder that looks at the embeddings from the encoder and produces an output sequence. And for a very long time, the, uh, the go-to method when it comes to sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning was recurrent neural networks. And recurrent neural networks essentially process the input one position at a time and produce an embedding that summarizes all the information of the previous tokens. So recurrent neural networks are inherently sequential, and that makes them slow. You have to operate over the input in sequence. In 2017, and I'm sure most of, of you have heard about this, Google presented an alternative, like a next generation way to do sequence to sequence, and they call it the transformer. The transformer architecture doesn't need recurrence anymore. So with the transformer, you can attend to all the inputs at once, and that makes training very fast. Of course, the key thing when you want to understand language is context. The meaning of a word depends on the context. And so the embedding of a word should also depend on that context. With a recurrent neural network, you already incorporate context because the single state that you compute contains the information of the entire sequence. What the transformer is doing, it's using something called self-attention. And self-attention allows the transformer to look at the surrounding words, at the context, and determine to which extent they are relevant for the current word. And this also is possible to do in, in parallel. So the transformer is very, very fast. And ever since it has been introduced, it's really at the bottom of all the recent breakthroughs in natural language processing. Basically, every time you read something about a state-of-the-art result, chances are very good that the transformer sits at the bottom. It's at the core of Google's BERT. It also sits at the core of OpenAI's GPT-2, a model that was deemed too dangerous to release for quite a while. You probably read about this. And so my thinking was, maybe I can use this these breakthroughs, this very powerful method to go from one sequence to another sequence and simply learn a mapping that goes from natural language to a structured search query. What makes this appealing is traditionally when you do natural language processing, you have a pipeline. You have several steps that operate on the input. You have maybe a and then you remove stop words. 
or you clean your input in some way. When we use these approaches, we can simply feed in inputs and outputs and the model worries about the rest. So it's end-to-end -end learning. It's similar to what happened in image recognition. So in the beginning, in computer vision, people would also construct uh, filters to extract features from images, and these would be hand, handcrafted uh, filters. And then at some point on top, they would learn some simple classifier until 2012. And in 2012, what happened is they started to learn end-to-end. -end. So straight from the pixels to what you're interested in, and let the neural network worry about computing the intermediate representations. And the transformer, or these end-to-end -end natural language models, they allow you to do something similar. So in successive steps, they refine the representation of words, always accounting for the context, and they've just proven to be very, very powerful. So before I talk a little bit more about the data, the training, and also the deployment of this, I want to show you a couple of examples from the live system. So we're live in, in all of Germany for a couple of weeks now. And on the top left, you see a very simple query. You usually just typed in the name of the model. The system was smart enough to say, hey, I've seen this before. This is a fiat. And uh, do the corresponding query for a make and a model. In the middle, you see an example for a query that also contains a range restriction. So a user is only interested in cars before 1970. And on the last <coughs> panel, you see a user that didn't even specify make or model. He's simply interested in red coupés built between 1960 and 1980. So far, this is all queries that contain filters and range queries. But we also sometimes need keywords. So here on the left, we have a very specific query, likely done by a user who knows something about American muscle cars. He's looking for a very specific engine size, denoted in cubic inches. And this is information we don't have available for most of our listings. But we make it searchable if it's part of the title of the listing. So here the system was smart enough to say, hey, this is a reasonable thing to describe a listing. I'm just going to put this into the version field. And we were able to find the listing using keyword search. The reason why this is really cool is the system also has learned to ignore certain things. So it doesn't just copy everything it doesn't know about into the version field. Otherwise, it would have a lot of results that just don't give you any listings. So the system has already learned to ignore certain inputs. For example, if you mistake us for Google, which happens, people type in the name of our competitors, we kindly ignore you. Um, there's also a lot of stuff that doesn't have to do anything with cars in which we still see it. But in this case, it was able to realize this makes sense as a keyword. And this is actually non-trivial. Like if you wanted to build something like this from hand, it would actually be rather complicated. But with a sequence-to-sequence -sequence approach, you can just show the system examples. And it's just going to learn to make these mappings by itself. Now in the middle, you see a combination of a filter, a keyword, and a range query. And on the last panel, you see a rather complex query. We don't see these a lot, but it's possible. In principle, you can search for cars before 1980 with more than 200 horsepower between 30 and 50,000 euros. So the last three examples I want to show you illustrate what I mean by context. Because the meaning of a word really is highly dependent on context. And keep in mind, for this system, 2002 is just another word. It's just another input token. So all three queries contain BMW 2002, but they have completely different meanings, and the system is able to extract that meaning. In the first panel, we have a search for a very specific BMW, a BMW 2002. In the middle panel, a user looks for BMWs before the year 2002, so that's a range query for a first registration. And in the last panel, a user is looking for cars below 2,000 euros, essentially. Once again, the system here looks at the context and is able to update the representation of 2002 and then translate it correspondingly to a structured query. Now, I want to give you some idea of the variety we see in the real system, because all the examples that I showed you were simple in the sense that they didn't contain any misspellings or any typos. Now, I did expect some typos when we went live with the system, but I was still surprised at the sheer amount of typos. And this is just a fraction of what we're observing, and these are three fairly well-known makes. And um, you see there's like no end to, 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 to typos. And if you just think about how difficult it would be to build a regex that could handle this input, 
It just highlights how cool it is that we now have systems that can learn this end to end. So as I mentioned before, our goal with the system is really to have something that is robust, that can ignore irrelevant inputs, that can handle typos, um, that can handle informal language, synonyms, and all these things. But when you want to train such a system, you need data. Now, for me, this was a problem, because here I was with this idea to build something, but we never had a search functionality with free text. So I was lacking the input data. Typically, when you want to, trans uh, when, when you want to train a neural machine translation model, you need what's known as a parallel corpus. So you have two files. In each of the lines, you have one sentence. And there's a line-to-line -line correspondence, let's say, from English to German. And then the system can learn the mapping. In our case, I didn't have the input. I didn't have natural language queries. All we had were structured queries, millions of those. So I was thinking to myself if it would be possible to generate some artificial training data using simple rules, essentially back translating from the structured query to one of many possible variations of natural language. And that's what I did. I just wrote a simple script, generated a couple of million training examples, and trained a model. And then I put it in a little uh, Flask web app, and I showed it to the PMs, the program managers uh, I work with. And it's quite amazing when you are able to, it's not a core data science skill, but for me it has proven to be very valuable, when you're able to build something and then show it to people. You can build a little demo, can put it into the hands of people, and they can play with it. Because despite the fact that the model was only trained on very simple artificial data and hasn't seen a lot of variability, it already performed quite well. It was actually already able to generalize beyond the examples that I've shown it. And so I got a green light to go live. And the idea here was build a simple model based on this artificial data and then go into production and refine it using real user feedback. Because if a user is not happy with the answer that we, we provide, at least some users are going to correct that query. They're going to resort to the filters and they're going to make a correction. Then we can learn from that correction and retrain the model. And so over time, the model becomes better. And that's what we did. So we went initially live with just 10% of our users back in April. And that initial test was unusual because we didn't try to gauge the user engagement. It was not a normal A-B test. We just did this to generate more data for the model to learn from. And since then, we have refined it a bunch of times with more and more data. And a few weeks ago, we went live. So now all users in Germany can play with the system. All right, so we have our idea. We have the data. Now we need to train. Luckily, we live in great times. There's amazing frameworks out there, like PyTorch and TensorFlow. And I decided to make use of a very specific library called tensor to tensor which builds on TensorFlow. What makes tensor to tensor very special is it's maintained by the folks at Google Brain. And it's the same code base that they use internally. What this means for you, if you use it, is that within days of a new paper appearing on archive, the code is here. You can play with it. Sometimes the code appears before the paper is written, and then there's a little note in the code, say, write paper. So this is very cool because it allows someone like me who's not being paid to re-implement uh, other people's research. You know, I'm, I'm measured against delivering value to the business. It allows me to stay at the cutting edge of research in this field. They're just using what, what the kind folks at Google Brain make available. And so you find all the, all the publications there and also many more papers that Google researchers didn't write themselves it's really meant as a way to, to start you on reproducible research. So it contains a lot of uh, standard data sets, it contains a lot of models and the hyperparameters, which makes it very easy to really reproduce results. So the normal guesswork that would be involved in trying to replicate some paper, is not, you don't have this here. And they even um, test the implementations regularly against regressions. So you can be sure if you want to, let's say you read, a, you read one of those papers, you want to um, duplicate one of the results with this library, you can do it because it's, it's tested. And it's very simple. So you just install it using pip, and then all you need to specify is a model, for example, a transformer, a problem, for example, English to German, a directory where your data lives, some hyperparameters, and for the default uh, problems, they already come with a library. And the last one is a training directory. Now, if you now point TensorBot to that training directory, it's very easy to log experiments. 
And what you see here are uh, three different experiments I was running. On the top panel you see the uh, training loss and also the validation loss. And all models have been trained for exactly the same amount of time. So for the same um, number of epochs. But you see if you look at wall time, they differ. So some models take a lot more uh, wall time to actually train. That's the first thing that's interesting. And on the bottom there's a bunch of metrics that show you the quality of the generated output. Now in our case, it's different from natural language where there's multiple ways to say the same thing. We really want the query to be accurate so it can be executed and return results. So the middle, um, middle metric, the accuracy per, se per, per sentence or per sequence, is the one um, I look at the most. But the key takeaway here is um, that we're really very lucky that Google decided to conduct their research in the open with the, with the brain team and you can build on state-of-the-art results with very little effort, try different architectures, typically just a couple lines of code that you need to change, and just see if it applies to your model, which, may, which it may not. So sometimes the latest, greatest model is actually not the best fit for your current problem, but this enables rapid experimentation and you can quickly iterate. What's also very great is it's just one line to export this into a servable. And that was one of the main reasons I decided to use TensorFlow, because the ecosystem around TensorFlow is just amazing. It's, it's, I mean, when you want to deploy models to production, it's way more than just training. You have things like data pre-processing, where you need to worry about uh, consistency between the batch processing you do and then uh, online serving. You have things like uh, checking that your data doesn't drift over time. You need to validate your models before you push them to production. All these things are available in a another um, framework provided by Google called um, TFX, TensorFlow Extended. So let's talk a little bit about the production uh, environment. So as I mentioned before, initially I was just building a little demo, a little HTML front end for people to play with. If you want to go to production, it's very important that the thing scales, that it can handle bursts uh, and spikes in traffic. What's not so great about Flask is it's synchronous, so that means it's blocking which is to say the time that the model is still computing the response, during that time the, the API would be blocked, it could not accept any fresh uh, requests. So for this project I decided to use Starlet, which is a completely asynchronous framework. What this means is the API itself can continue to accept incoming requests and just hand them over to a second component. And that second component is the model serving component. And what's very nice here is for the model serving component, I can do request batching, which is to say the second component can wait for a couple of milliseconds, gather all the requests, and then process them at once. And that makes it very efficient, and I can also handle spikes very, um, very nicely. It also makes for good utilization of the resources. So this is really the last thing I wanted to leave you with, and that's uh, the component calls, called TensorFlow Serving. It's part of TFX. And basically what, what happens, so you train your model on your problem and you're happy with it, it's a one-line command from tensor to tensor to export that into a saved model format. And if you now run the TensorFlow serving binary, which is just, just a little C binary, it's production hardened code used by Google also internally, has been out there for, for a few years now, you can just point TensorFlow serving at a folder and put your model inside that folder. And then what TensorFlow serving does for you, it provides you both the REST and the GRCP API that you can talk to. If you're interested in performance, then of course you use GRPC. And this is also what we're doing here. So the front end can continue to uh, accept requests, tokenizes those with the vocabulary that we used for to train the model, builds a little protobuf, and then talks to via GRPC to the model server. And then once the response is ready, it returns that to, to our consumers. What's also really nice about TensorFlow Serving is there's a model watcher component. So if you have a new model, you can just drop it in the folder. And it, uh, what the system will do, it will answer the current requests with the old model, and then it will switch over to the new model. So there's no need for you to start new instances or new dockers or whatever. So I think it's a very nice piece of code, and what it really allows you to do is you can ve very quickly move from experimentation to production. Um, also, if you don't really have resources from engineering available. So me as a data scientist, I can build the model, I can deploy it to production, and it, it, it scales. So that's very nice, and it's all because we have these nice tools. 
And um, so just to conclude, I think I was faster than I expected. We wanted to build this new feature that allows users to quickly get into the search funnel without having to worry about filters. And we approach this using sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning, where we really end-to-end -end learn the mapping from the input the user types in, typos and everything, to the corresponding output. We trained using TensorFlow, more specifically the Tensor to Tensor library, and then use TensorFlow serving to, uh, to serve this in production. And what we see so far from the user engagement, the feature is well received. And we see people now looking for old police cars or fire trucks or BMWs from the 80s. Like very specific things, and also users who don't quite know what they're looking for, they can just say, I want a hybrid below 30,000 euros. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting alternative to the very rigid search entry that you normally have when you just go down filters and you select make, model, and then make it more and more specific. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you made a uh, training example in an artificial way. Mm -hmm. uh, how it was? You, were, you have a large uh, database and uh, with uh, different combinations of parameters like age of the car, price and so on. You uh, create a uh, large amount of this combination and then use some tool to make it uh, like uh, na natural uh, natural queries, right? Yes, yes, somehow. So I actually didn't, I could have also used the right artificial combinations because we know our taxonomy, so I could have just generated all kinds of combinations. But I actually looked at actual queries, so what we really see users are looking for. So I observed the structured queries already. Uh, from where you take these uh, queries, user queries? Oh, in our logs. It's, oh, it's, it's oh. part of the URL, essentially. If you look for a car, already the old system, using Elasticsearch, it's, it's all encoded in the URL. So I took the b a bunch of URLs that I just observe users generating when they search for cars, and then I wrote, wrote a simple script that maps that back to, to natural language. And of course, I couldn't incorporate all the variability because different people would express themselves differently. So it was very limited. In the, in the beginning, the system was also a little bit brittle. So in the beginning, when you would show it an input it hasn't seen before, it would sometimes react very, very strangely. And that's why it was so important to retrain it and, and refine it using production data. Yeah, yeah. And uh, an another little question. Uh, as I understand, you generate, uh, you, uh, you get more data from user uh, interactions, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so if uh, you have some, uh, if user put some uh, query in your box and uh, you provide him uh, some contact and he select uh, a specific car, then mm -hmm. we think that uh, it, it, it is connected with the query. Yes, is it the way? Yes, so the way it works, the system provides an output and if the user is not happy with the results of the system, he's not going to interact with the results straight away. He's going to resort back to the filters. He's gonna, either he's going to try a new query or he's going to make a correction using filters. So this is not meant to replace the existing filters, it's just a, an additional search entry. And what we see actually also happening is users sometimes they're just corrected. So you type something in, system didn't recognize it, you can just correct that. And I learned from that correction. So I'm essentially yeah, using our users to teach the system more tricks. Yeah. I see, thank you. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Quite a similar question to the one uh, before. How big was the difference between the real engineered faked input and the real user input? So, What do you mean by difference? Sorry? What do you mean by difference? Um, how well could you predict the real, uh, the real users typing in real yeah. natural la language um, sentences with yeah. your... With your way of doing it. So initially the capabilities of the system reflected my own biases when I decided to write simple rules to construct natural language. So only queries that were very similar to the, the ones I constructed that could be answered. The system did generalize a little bit. I think it's similar to when you train on ImageNet and you show it an image it hasn't seen before. It also makes an educated guess sometimes. But if you would show it completely different input, it would just freak out. For example, the system right now, just recently I've, I've seen people copy over entire URLs and I never trained it to pass URLs and ignore HTTP, WW and all that stuff, but the system just do does it now. And if, if part of the URLs are usable, so if there's a make or a model or a year in there, 
the system is going to use that. It's going to kickstart your, your search in our platform. And, um, but I never taught it that specifically. Initially, however, it would have done something stupid. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so in the beginning, you mentioned a few aspects like filters and keywords. Mm -hmm. But what if a user gives something which is not in that basic query, say right. like a red car or something like that? I mean, red car works. Car is just being ignored because it's, it's already implicit if you're on our platform. And red is being used as a filter. But you're right, there are still things I can't map. So the restriction is really what we can express in filters or keywords. And um, my hope is actually that this, because the capabilities of the underlying technology, they're really, there's almost no limit to what these things can learn. So my hope is it's going to learn different languages next. So right now it's just live in Germany. We want to train it on uh, Spanish and Italian, all these languages, same system. And um, hopefully at some point it will also learn to map things that don't have a direct correspondence to a filter. For, for example, sports car. It's nothing we have in our taxonomy. But maybe at some point, because a user provided us with this, with this input, it will translate a sports car as a two-seater over 150 horsepower, for example. So that's going to be very interesting to witness which direction it takes. Thank you. Hi. Um, okay. The question is, uh, how do you structure results for a category? What would be the first uh, point, for instance, for red BMW? So what is the year would be the first for red BMW? Do you boost somehow uh, some attributes of cars? Because it is important to show very good first, yes. second, and third car. And how do you manage this? Yeah. So I think your question is really about the search component itself. And I'm not even touching search. So I'm just mapping from natural language to structured search. And we still process this with our existing search stack, which is Elasticsearch. So I, I just go from freeform input to a structured uh, uh, query. And then the rest happens using our existing search stack. Uh, hi, Juan uh, Did you manage to include the location? Yes. Al unless here in Spanish, it's very people, you know, look for, for cars near their place. So. Yes. So right now in Germany, you can provide a city name or a zip code. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when we put it live all over Europe, because then we're going to have cities that also correspond to the names of certain cars. And then we need to disambiguate. it. And also zip, zip codes look very differently in different countries. So, but I, I, the potential is there. The, the model itself could easily learn that. It's just a question of time, I guess. Hi. <clears throat> and so for the structured output, just to understand, so mm -hmm. is it, is it, are you generating something like a JSON string or just the URL where the filters are in? It's just a URL, but I could also output, <coughs> output JSON. Okay, and then in general, like if you want to, to incorporate basic, to make sure that it understands the entirety of your taxonomy, you would really just generate more training examples from, from what you have in your... Yeah. So my, my hope is that now I can kind of rely less and less on these artificial examples and just, that's already happening, now we get live, live queries in a, in a quantity that's large enough to just train it on, on actual user input. So the only extension I have in mind is to teach the system to map more fields. So initially we started with a subset of, of fields that could be mapped to a structured query to extend that and then of course to train it on different languages. Hi. I have a question. You said mm -hmm. that you want to translate, like, like you want to train also other languages. Mm -hmm. Will you train all the system like, from scratch or you will find a way to translate what you already trained? So I'm very lucky. I work with a great uh, set of engineers and also PMs who, who are willing to experiment. And I think they may allow me to just put the German version live in Spain, for example. Yeah, like it is a good idea. Because then it already works for make model, prices are going to work, years are going to work. Some things are not going to work, like, uh, I don't know, menos de dos mil. So there's different ways to say below 2,000 euro, for example, depending on the language. But I think the system is going to learn this very quickly. So uh, it just needs to pick up, I think, the different um, translations for equipments, maybe and then how to express more or less in all these, these little um, quantifiers to understand the query pro uh, correctly. But it's already going to work, I think, well enough so people can use it. And then hopefully they make some corrections and I can learn from that. So um, do you and how do you evaluate the um, 
correctness of uh, this thing and like do you track how it improves or um, worsens over time? Yes, that's a good question. So one thing is, of course, offline. We can just look at the metrics I just showed you. For example, accuracy per sentence tells me how often did it really exactly match the, the query I was looking for. Online, we can look at different metrics, like, like user engagement, like did we show a user something that he then ended up looking at or clicking or even contacting the seller? So that's something we incorporate. And then... Uh is it like um, how much possible is that um, the model which was trained earlier somehow drifts from the reality? So probably it's not so bad as it's re relearned all the time, right? It's, it's quite possible because there's new models introduced all the time. And um, yeah, so every time a new car is basically um, put into the world, the model needs to learn that this car exists. But yes, by retraining, it's not always going to be perfectly up to date, but I think within a couple of days it will always know about what's, what's currently out there. <laughs>